So hello everybody, my name is Eugene Bechkov and uh, um, my partner and my colleague Julian Milkis, usually we having this conversation under the label Julian Milkis presents and uh, uh, today you'll, you'll, you'll be hearing less of me, much more of Julian and Julian please introduce our, uh, our, our a guest, because it's a big honor to have uh, this person in our conversation. Go ahead, Julian. Absolutely. Well, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce Rachel. Uh, Rachel. Um, she's a daughter of Benny Goodman. Uh, that I don't have to introduce Benny Goodman. Everybody knows. And we we talked about this for a long time with Eugene and wanted to have this and since Rachel just finished the book about her father, so we thought it's the right time to have her as a guest. And mainly she will talk and she has a lot to say and many, many memories. And Rachel, please say hello and we'll, we'll start. We'll start improvising wonderful yes i i told julian just before we began recording that we're going to swing together and improvise and um so first i want to say that the book is not strictly about my father at all the book is about my relationship with him and how incredibly difficult it was and um and what happened to me during the year and a half I spent writing it, um, which was that I truly, I began writing the book for two reasons. Who the hell was this man who had such power in the world and power over me? Um, and that power that he had over me was in large part because I happen to have been born gifted musically. And it was very clear from the beginning, and it, I think it became clearer to me as I grew older, but he was he was so difficult to live with. And I wanted to I wanted to come to terms with him. I had a wonderful editor um, who was with me just about every step of the way. I had begun writing the book before I met this woman, Kathleen Ellis. And when she began, when we began together, she said something like, Rachel, I hope you can wind up at the end of this process loving your father. And I thought, forget that. <laughs> That's never going to happen. I hate him too much. And my God, it did happen. I did wind up loving him because... Well, I went through this lengthy process of, of, I would just call it coming to terms with who he was. And that involved seeing how difficult his life was, seeing how unbearable in a way the life of any celebrity is. And this is very much an aspect of my book, which... Um, one day when it's published, I hope will be a benefit to other offspring of celebrities. Um, when, well, not that every celebrity is born a genius in my mind. However, my father was. And I had an interesting conversation with somebody just last week. So here I am, I'm turning 81 in the beginning of May, and I'm still seeing things, which is very saying things about him, which is very wonderful. And this woman was saying, Rachel, you'll never be able to imagine your way into the depth of poverty of your father's childhood. I mean, I was born his daughter. I was born rich. My mother was a Vanderbilt. My father was already well established. And he grew up in a Chicago slum where there was he was the ninth of 12. There was the streets, there was some outdoor plumbing. 
The streets were full of horse excrement. Um, sometimes there was no food and he wanted out. And he made his way out driven by that genius he had, that musical gift, and also his stunning discipline. He was really an amazingly disciplined person. Although I have to say, I recently met a man who um, worked a lot with, with recording with recording for Mick Jagger. Mick Jagger practiced his moves all day long. What a surprise. <laughs> and you know, oh, I didn't know that. Huh. Yeah, I mean, I would never have guessed that. The behind the scenes life of a celebrity is so different than what the media portrays. And the media creates an image of somebody who's perfect. And then there's a whole celebrity worship in this culture, which is worse than ever, huh? Worse than ever, because it's so superficial. And so yep. for me, being able to see how hard it was for my father, how much he had to leave behind, how much he had to forget. And, um, okay, so what, what do you want to say next? I mean, there's a lot more I can say, Julian, but it helps me. Well, if you I just, I, I have, for me, the biggest shock when we met and when I started coming to his apartment, uh, well, I always knew that he was a perfectionist and that he worked a lot, but I couldn't imagine anybody working that hard. He was a workaholic into his 70s. He practiced every single day and not just practice, he worked for hours yeah. and uh, clarinet and music was basically his life. Everything else was secondary. Absolutely. And, and also when we, you know, we didn't go out together that much. F a few times he took me out and he once he came to a theater where I worked and only then I realized what a celebrity he was when we would go out of his apartment on um, Third Avenue, 65th Street. And as soon as we would be out, and he was in his 70s, there would be a crowd around. It, it was like probably like Beatles in, in England. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I must say that he enjoyed it. He enjoyed it. When it wasn't driving him crazy, and um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm not, okay, this is where I guess where I want to go. And it was my piano teacher, a wonderful woman called Louise Viscursion, who was then a professor at Harvard, um, who said to me, pointed out, you know, Rachel, your father, in a way, was at his height at the, when he was 29 at the Carnegie Hall Jazz Concert. And then yep. what's he going to do? What do you do when you're at your height that young? How do you hold on? How do you grab? How do you keep grabbing what you're aiming for? And something that had a big effect on me recently, the movie Maestro about Leonard Bernstein, done by Bradley Cooper, which I saw, I saw it four times. It led me to write a new chapter for my book, which is called Benny Wasn't Lenny. Because... Ah. <laughs> you didn't talk, I didn't know that. Huh. Yeah, that's that's a, the only thing that I've written recently. Um, my father, on one level, no, on every level, he kept playing the same music. He kept playing swing, the 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 jazz arrangements by by Lester um, Henderson, and he kept playing the same pieces of classical music. Yeah, Mozart and Brahms always. Oh, yeah. But then there was also the Weber and there was the stuff yep. he um, he commissioned, like the bar talk. But yes, um, Mo Mozart and Brahms absolutely were his, I guess, his most sacred pieces. And so, you know, I've I had never I'd never been a fan of Bernstein. I'd never seen his his talks that he would give at Harvard. And, you know, here's this man quoting poetry with talking about cultural construction, talking about the history of ideas. And I was, it made me laugh. My father, who A, didn't hardly grew up in a middle class family as Bernstein did, hardly went to Harvard. My father stopped school in the ninth grade because he was supporting his family. Um, 
my father was so narrow-minded in every level. And that really interests me. Seeing it wasn't, again, as I say, until I saw Bernstein, that I realized how extraordinarily focused my father was. And I don't know how he did it. I mean, I'm somebody, I need lots of different kinds of stimuli, ideas, teaching, writing. That was one thing. And also my relationships are really important to me. They weren't important to him. As you said, Julia, it was mm. just. But Rachel, I don't know if I ever mentioned this. Well, as, as we, we, we talked about it, I learned a lot from him. Like he changed my sound. and But he said once very important thing that stuck in my mind. He said, every time you play a piece that you played many, many times, play it like you're playing it for the first time and like you're playing it for the last time. Oh, wow. So this is for very pro brilliant. profound and it's very important. So and, and, and he did that for sure. Wow. Well, I never... I love that. That's so beautiful and indeed poetic and psychological. Yeah. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> it's the first time and the last time. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, you'll never get another chance. Give it everything you have. That's right. Because you just never know. So, And, and if you try to play it every single time the same, it becomes mechanical. It doesn't make sense. It's not music anymore. Yeah. Yeah. There. So... I don't know, I hope this is relevant. Um, I play a lot of music on YouTube on my computer because it's available. <clears throat> Just discovered, I don't remember his name, some extraordinary, I think, Spanish cellist doing the um, Kodai Cello Sonata Number no. 8, which is one of my favorite pieces in the uh -huh. world. I don't know string instruments, but that has got to be a killer of a piece. Uh -huh. And so when I look at a musician now, or an actor, anybody who's an artist, I think of the hours and hours and hours, countless, that went into reaching that level of perfection. So this guy, he looked to be, I don't know, in his maybe, maybe 30 years old. And I was thinking, God, he's probably been playing that piece since he was six, right? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. between, and so I just want to say another thing about um, my father and quote unquote relationships for him. I spoke to a very wise woman about a year ago, and she said, your father's life was one of collateral damage. He hurt people wherever he went. And I think there is some truth to that. He had a terrible reputation, being unpredictable and sometimes nasty and often stingy. And then there was, <laughs> there was this very famous Ray, of his is Ray, true. yes, that Ray. I experienced twice. <laughs> the 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 um sort of undecipherable glare that he'd give uh, about which I want to say something in in a moment. Um, well, I guess I'll say it right now. Um, so my father had a very close friend in San Francisco, a well known columnist called Herb Cain, a fellow Jew, and Herb Cain said. That what that look meant was go out and wash my car. <laughs> and it was, it was very demeaning. But I also know that from my reading that um, when they were in their 20s, he was playing with Jack Teagarden, the trombonist, and he was giving the ray to Jack, and who said, Penny, stop. I, I can't play when you're looking at me like that. Mm. I'm feeling so judged. And my father said, Oh, Jack, I'm just so knocked out by the way you're playing. So he, I don't think that Benny could help himself with this, this look of absorption. I don't think he knew what it meant. God knows he was not introspective. He would just kind of glom on. Yeah. I told you about the recording um, that he did in, in Basel, 1953, with Dick Hyman. It was the first time they played together. And Dick gave me the CD. And I came home and I listened. I called him and I said, Dick, don't tell me it's a live recording. He said, it's a live recording. And I said, it's absolutely impossible to play that that perfectly. It's even, it's scary. It's abnormal. 
Who yeah. was, who was, excuse me, Julian, who was playing? It was the, what was so perfect, the ensemble or what? Ensemble, everything. It was perfection in its, I mean, you, you'll never hear in any, in classical or in jazz, music perfection like that. And, and Dick laughed and he said, do you know how much he made us rehearse? He said, we rehearsed each song for hours. And said, even if one of us would be dead, they would still play it. I <laughs> just love that. Yeah, and it's it's absolutely one of the best recordings ever. Yeah, well, that's what it means to be a perfectionist. And I will just say that I, for better and for worse, as most things usually are, I inherited that need for perfection in what I do. And... Um, it's one of the many, many reasons that I gave up playing the piano, which I began, I don't know, I think not much older at all than that picture we just showed in the beginning. Yeah. Um, and for me, this is something I wrote about in my book, that it was as though... Um, when I played, it was often as though there was Benny sitting on my shoulder and judging me. And it was, it was really, it, it became unbearable. And then, mm -hmm. um, and I loved, and I still love classical music and I, I listen to it all the time, but I sold my piano um, five years ago. I hadn't yep. played it for years. And um, what I felt was that my father had taken up permanent residence in my piano. Yeah. And every time I went to play it, there he was. And I had to escape him. And it's so interesting to me that writing a book about our relationship was one of the, one of the ways that I escaped him, which sort of is illogical, but it was Rachel, you know, I still I still have a dream. I'll visit you in LA and we'll read through Brahms Sonata. Mm. Just for the hell of it. Um, well, Julian, I haven't played for so many years. <laughs> okay, that's you, okay. What, what I, happened with the, the slow movement? <laughs> slow movement. Yeah. Oh, so um, I want to make, let's see. There's so many things we need to talk about, Julian. Um, I, I want to talk about a very amusing thing that happened with Richard Stoltzman. This is years ago. I was living in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. And he was playing in town and I wrote him a letter which somehow got to him and I said, could he come over for a meal? So I wanted to play with him the, um, I guess it's the Largo, the slow movement of the, of the F minor Brahms sonata. Yeah. And because my father never played it as slowly as I wanted it to be. And an important aside, I had no idea that the reason he wouldn't play it as slowly as I wanted was that he couldn't. He didn't have the wind. Yes. He we never... talked to you about it, yeah. If only if he knew how to breathe, how to circle or breathe. Yes. So he didn't. He didn't know what it changed his life, as we've said, Julian. So I wanted to play it with um Stoltzman at the tempo that I had always envisioned. But before we began, <laughs> he said, Um, Rachel, do you have any dental floss? I said, What? He said, Dental floss. And then he said, your father didn't floss his teeth before he played? And I said, God, no. And then <laughs> Stoltzman said, ah, I, I hate to think of all the locks and bagels that wound up in his clarinet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Benny brushed his teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, but he didn't yeah. floss before he played. And... I never floss before I play. I brush my teeth. Oh, okay, but he didn't do that. That I know of. I think I, I, think, I, think I would know. So... So I want to go back to his his personality and his drive. Um, well, actually, let's talk now about the reeds. Um, there's a chapter in my book that called the Reed Quest, and Julian, obviously, you know much more about this than I would. My father kept recycling his reeds; he never threw any away, and when he died. My sister Benji and I and his secretary, Muriel Zuckerman, went through every corner of the house in Connecticut, the apartment in New York, 
and we collected 3,500 something reads. Sure, sure. I sure. see your face, Eugene, how stunned you are at that. And um, so I think very often he, there was a kind of ritual in trying out the reeds. And I now understand how essential, how a clarinet is no, is no better, right, Julian, than the reed that somebody's playing it with. The, no, the, if the reed is not good, yeah. then even if you have the world's best clarinet, it, it won't help. Exactly. So what's it, important is the read. But what fascinated me is that they were all only quote temporarily out of favor. That he kept recycling them and trying them again, almost like a a musician <clears throat> who who needs another chance to play better. And um, right, but when the temperature changes, the read that was bad, it can suddenly become you know very playable, and vice versa. Oh my God! Yes, oh, reads are as unpredictable as humans. <laughs> More, <laughs> but you know, Rachel. Once I came for a lesson, and Benny was very upset, very angry. He was looking for a reed, and he couldn't find one. And the That's floor one. was covered with reeds. He would just try and throw it on the floor. Try oh. and throw it on the floor. That's right. And when he practiced, the floor was always covered with reeds. Yeah. Always. And so this is another interesting thing about him. He was an incredibly neat man. Um, his The way he hung up his clothes, our house was always neat, except when my sister Benji and I were doing projects. But when he'd come home for the weekend, we'd have to clear everything up and um, make the place beautiful. But there were two ways, two areas in which he was extremely messy. One is the floor covered with reeds. He didn't put them back in their own boxes or, you know, organize them as to what was better or worse. And the other thing was he had a really tiny record collection. I mean, so if you can see my hands here, I don't yeah. think the, L the LP collection that he had, maybe maximum 100, maybe, maybe. And um, he would take the records, the LPs out of their jackets, and he wouldn't put them back in again. Mm -hmm. It's pretty interesting that these two areas, which were most specifically musical in his life, there he was the most messy, which kind of counterbalanced the perfectionism. Yeah, and, and also I have to say he was and still is the best dressed man that I've ever met. <laughs> Even at home, you know, he never wore jeans or okay. slippers, no. perfect shoes, wonderful, you know, sweater or jacket, uh, slacks, you know, it was all had to be perfect. Yes. And so perfectionism is a hard way to live your life. I mean, in a way, it's beautiful and it's wonderful, but you pay a big price. And um, yeah, so the more I know about him, the more I see that it that this characteristic carried over in 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 every area. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, Julian, I think it would be very interesting for people to know for you to tell the tale of how it was that you met him, and also about Irina and that amazing situation. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, we've we've talked about it with Eugene already, but I'll I'll make it a short version. Uh, it happened um, when I was uh, I had a lesson with my regular teacher, Leon Rashanov, and later I found out that uh, Benny and, and, Goodman studied with him. Mm -hmm. This is a deal, right? Uh -huh. but th th this is in 1982. And uh, 82, 83, 82 or 83, I, I, now I don't remember. And suddenly Leon said, uh, you know, that there was a concert yesterday in New York, Verder Trio. It was a, a, a lady clarinetist, very fine player. Her husband was a violinist and a pianist. And he said, Benny Goodman showed up. And he said he disliked it so much that he got up in the middle of the concert, made the smirk, and walked out. Everybody saw. 
Julian, I didn't know that story. Oh my oh, God. Yeah. Oh, it was sure. devastating. Yeah, that was his rudeness. He didn't care. Yeah. He didn't care. He just walked out. And obviously, uh, Elsa must have seen it. I, I, I can imagine the, the, the shock. Uh, and But I didn't care about the story. I said, Leon, Benny Goodman lives in New York? <laughs> and they said, of course, in New York. Where where do you think he lived? And I said, I, I just, I I never gave it a thought. I didn't know. And and then I said, this was in September. And in November, I was playing my debut at Carnegie Hall. And one of the pieces was uh, Contrast by Bartok that uh, Benny commissioned and the, the, the famous recording with Sigeti and Bartok. And I said, Leon, do you think it, it's possible that I can play this for him? And Leon went, oh, Julian, this is nonsense. He is not friendly. He doesn't like colleagues. He doesn't like clarinetists. Forget about it. And I said, I want to play for it. And I was so young and pushy that Leon said, <laughs> It's a good okay. episode. Pushy's good. Yeah, you want to be embarrassed? I'll get you his number. He, he won't even talk to you. He will he will not answer the phone. So he gave me the phone number and I got my sort of energy and nerves together. And I called him and it was Sunday. And he had he didn't answer the phone. There was a, a lady, the secretary. And she answered the phone and I said, I'm such and such. I'm a young clarinetist. I'm giving my debut and I'm playing a, a piece that Mr. Goodman commissioned. Would it be possible to play for him? So she asked me, where are you from, blah, blah, blah. And she said, uh, well, I'll give him all the information. And if he decides to call you, he'll call you. So that was it. And I waited for maybe half an hour. And I thought, no way, he's not calling me. And literally, I was walking out the door and I was locking my door. And there was a phone call. And I, I came back and I said, hello. And he had this <clears throat> little horsey voice I said, mm, Julian yeah this is Benny Goodman <laughs> and I remember when he said that I collapsed literally I sat on the floor and uh, my English wasn't great to begin with but it, it was non-existent <laughs> <laughs> so, and and he was you know I was surprised he started asking me questions like he was genuinely interested as he was and he said, what else is on the program? And I said, I'm playing uh, Mozart Quintet, Brahms F minor. And it's just later I realized it coincided. These were his favorite pieces. And I'm playing Debussy Rhapsody. And I'll finish the concert with Bartek. And he said, young man, you know, you're playing the most well-known clarinet repertoire and most difficult if you think you can shock somebody in New York, you're wrong. It's not happening. And then they said, it's it's all very difficult. Then he took a, some time and then he said, well, do you think I can only be helpful with Bartek? Don't you think I can be helpful with Mozart and Brahms? Oh. And, uh, and then he said, well, okay. Uh, what are you doing tomorrow morning? It was Monday and Monday, my busiest day at uh, the master's program at Juilliard. And I said, oh, Mr. Goodman, free, it, nothing. I, I'm doing nothing. Of course, of course. And he goes, well, okay, I'll see you at 10, 10 in the morning. He gave me his address and he said, downstairs there's a concierge and I'll give you a name and, you know, come up. And I called Lee and right away, first I hang up and it was like, it's not happening. That's not happening. And I called right away. I called Liam. And Liam always knew me as a jokester. And they said, okay, very funny. Okay. You know, I'm, I, I, I can't talk right now. I said, Liam, I'm not joking. It's true. And it took me maybe 15 minutes to convince for him to realize that it's true. And then he gave me advices that worked. That if he didn't tell me, probably they would be not even the first lesson. I was at that time, I was not punctual. He said, you have to be on time. You have to be there precisely at 10 o'clock. You have to shave. You have to look good. No jeans, no sneakers. You have to wear a suit. 
And if you have a hat, wear a hat. Benny loves hats. Yes, he did love them. And I and said, so okay, nice. so I shaved, you know, I combed my hair. I put on the only suit that I had. And at 10 o'clock, I was knocking at his door, right at 10. And the, the door opens, it was like this light, you know, God himself is there. And then he, he did this. He looked at his beautiful Patek Philippe. <laughs> and he went like, hmm, right on time. You passed. You passed. Yeah. <laughs> and then he looked at me and said, nice hat. Mm -hmm. So everything worked. And then I, uh, you know, I walked in and he said, well, well come on in. And he said, so. And he was a you know, very imposing man. And then he said, okay, play. And I started putting my clarinet together and I'm shaking. I, I couldn't even put it together normally. And then I started playing and I couldn't play a note. I, I was so scared. And then he was actually very nice. He said, uh, uh, are you nervous? <laughs> and I said, Mr. Goodman, if you were me and I were you, would you be nervous? And he loved it. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, mm, I think so. Then he said, don't be nervous. I'll go have some coffee, warm up. And he gave me about 15 minutes and came back and I already, you know, was in control of my of my nerves and started playing. And it lasted, I think, about four hours. <laughs> and, and, and then at first I just played and then he, he, he took his clarinet out and he started he, he wasn't really good with words. Oh, that's an oh, that's an overstatement. Yeah, but, but he had no words. What he could show in five seconds would be better than five thousand words, you know. Yes, of course. I know. And 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 then he asked me, you know, and I was young and very macho, and all I was interested is in technique and staccata, very fast and very loud, and he said. What number of reads are you playing? I said, oh, Mr. Goodman, I'm playing number five. He said, number five? He said, you know, clarinet is a very difficult instrument. Why make your life more difficult? He said, you got to stop this nonsense. And they said, you know, if I see you again, uh, no number five. And he switched me from number five to number four and then to number three. Mm hmm Oh, mm -hmm. and, and then I experienced that famous ray at the oh. end of the lesson because, you know, saying goodbye and and I was standing and I said, Mr. Goodman, I don't know how to ask you, how much do I owe you for the lesson? And he gave me the ray that he stared me under the floor. <laughs> and, and, he, and, he, and he was quiet for like for a minute, which is eternity. And then he said, I do not charge colleagues. Yeah. It was like, wow. Right. And yeah. I said, can, yeah. I, can I play for you again? He said, yeah, come back tomorrow morning. So, well, yeah. I love, I love the story, Julian, and you're telling it a little bit differently. So, um, and also, you know what I think? He, you asked me already, and people ask me, were you that good? And I always say, I don't think so. Oh. I was good. Of course I was good. But there were other players like me or better than me. Yeah, but they hadn't they hadn't contacted him as you did. Yes. What was I think, you know, we'll never know. But why he was amazed that I got the nerve to call him and show up at his door and play for him because people will paralyzed just hearing his name. Julian, I'd like to say a few things here. Again, thank you for that marvelous story. He admired courage. He had a lot of courage. I mean, one of the most courageous things, obviously, he was known for was hiring Black musicians in the 30s when it just was unheard of and a real risk to his career. And he didn't care. Eddie Wilson was the first one, yeah. Yeah, and then Lionel Hampton. Lionel Hampton. Um, yep. And so, you know, as I listen to you telling this story, I'm thinking my mind's going in a bunch of directions. 
Um, so I don't know, the word beshert, is that Yiddish or Hebrew or Russian or what? What's the word? Beshert meant to be. Do you know that word, Julian? Or maybe I'm teaching you a word. No, no, I think it's in Yiddish. Yiddish, okay. So yeah. um, I mean, how on earth can we possibly understand the amazing things that happen in our lives? But it was a perfect meeting then for you and my father. Ah, I know, Julian, he needed you as much as you needed him. That's, I'd oh, say- no, I, I, I needed him much more. <laughs> no, no, I understand. But from an outsider perspective, I know that's true. He never uh, had- Yeah, Rachel, I want to switch before we both okay. forget. The yeah. story with Irene. Yes, oh, okay, okay. Let me yeah. just finish the sentence. Yeah, um, yeah go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Um, you were the son he never had who came to him at a time when his whole life was waning and you gave him something, a whole other dimension. So now the story of Irene, and it's hard to tell this because it's so um, mysterious. So my father had very, very difficult health. He lived in a lot of pain pretty much all the time. He never, ever spoke about it. And um, let's say I, he had a very bad back. And, you know, when you play the clarinet, very often you arch your back. And so you're squishing the, the vertebrae together. And he never talked about, he almost never talked about what was any kind of difficult for him. But I'm just going to make an aside here. This is in my book and say, um, one day we were sitting in the living room and he was quiet. He, you know, he didn't talk, which is really hard for a child when a parent doesn't talk because of course the child thinks, what's wrong with me? Don't I interest him? And out of nowhere, he said, this one's the big dipper, Rach. And he meant this was the most depressed he'd ever been. And I didn't even know, I didn't know what to say for that. So he was in physical pain. He was in emotional pain, which he could never discuss. I mean, like a lot of men, but especially then. And one of the things he did, part of his discipline was he would swim virtually every day of his life. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And he also did yoga for like four exercises. So um, he went to a place in Connecticut called Silver Hill, um, which was a place, well, he swam there. I think he saw a psychiatrist there for medication, but I never, I, I don't know about that, but I'm pretty sure. And one day he's walking around the grounds. It was a very, very elegant place. And um, his dog, Shimu, who had been my mother's dog, my mother had died, um, God, I, I, I'm not sure, like eight years before my father did. Well, she smoked herself to death. Alas, yep. I stopped smoking. Again, part of his discipline. And he's carrying the dog and the dog runs over to a lovely young woman. And he says to this lovely young woman, why did my dog go to you? And she said, because I speak dog. Mm. They became friends. Yep. Go and see her. And I wrote about this at length in my book. Um, Julian, you set me up with an yep. interview, which was amazing. And she saw, I, so you and she saw a different side of my father that I think anybody else in the world did, which is really extraordinary. He was so guarded. He was so silent. He was so inscrutable. Um, and she saw in him a very beautiful person. She was absolutely disinterested in his fame. She was disinterested in jazz. She liked Bach, especially Bach choral music. Mm -hmm. and um, she, I don't know how else to put this, she connected with him, I can call it at a spiritual level, at a profoundly um, rich psychological level, and she was very careful with him that 
she not kind of push him to reveal himself too much? Because she knew that if he did that, if he became too unguarded with her, that would that would end their friendship. And then the most and this this part always mesmerizes me. He said to her a few times, or what, what did he or did he did he say it to you, Julian? You remind me of somebody else. Did he say that to you or to her? To her. To her. He said, you remind me of somebody else. And he didn't go farther than that. And the somebody else that he reminded, that that um, she, Irene, reminded him of was you. And at this, you were both Russian Jews, young yeah. Russian Jews who came into his life at the same time when he was, I don't know how to put it, fading, when he was declining, he was running out of breath, he was holding on for, it's a cliche, for dear life. And yeah. both of you made his life so much more, more meaningful. Um, so, Julian, I'd like you to tell the tale of how, how it yeah. was. We it's actually it it's very fascinating. We it's were friends with, with Irene when I was a teenager. She was maybe a year older. In Russia. Later, right? in, 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 Russia. in Toronto, in oh, Canada. Okay. Okay. Later, she married my friend who was 10 years older. And they had a, a son. And then we lost touch. My friend died very young. and I haven't seen her in I don't know how many years, maybe 30 years. And I'm playing in Carnegie Hall, a big concert with an orchestra. And a day before the concert, she, the, this lady calls and said, I'm Irene, do you remember me? And I was like, I, I don't remember any Irene. She goes, don't you remember I, I married your friend? And I said, of course, it's been so long. And she said, how can I come to your concert? I saw it advertised. I was passing near Carnegie Hall. Are there any tickets left? And I think, I think, yeah, there's some tickets left upstairs. Anyway, she bought a ticket and after concert, she runs to me with <laughs> eyes wide open. She goes, oh my God, I have to talk to her right now. I said, I mean, I can't, there are all these people. She said, give me five minutes. She said, only today I realized that it's you. I said, of course it's me. <laughs> Who else? She, goes, no. <laughs> she said, you don't understand. Benny Goodman befriended me. And he was telling me about the young Russian Jewish student that he has. And he said, he never named you. I never knew who it was. And said, today when I opened the program, I read that you were said, everything clicked. Right. So, and then I put you two together and so it's it's pretty fascinating. Yeah. It, it is. It, it's very mysterious, Julian, at a number of levels. So um, I have a friend, I'm going to, she used a four-letter word here, which I won't use, but she always says, you can't write this stuff. In other words, it seems, it seems to come on, that kind of coincidence, and it's impossible, but it was possible. And it did, it did happen with the both of you. And um yeah, you were neither of you realized the relationship that my father had with the other. No, no, he never mentioned it to me. But you know, to me, he was really the god of music. Yes. To her, it was totally right. different. He was a, a man, right. human being, and they talked about life. And sh she said he was very, he was thinking a lot about it. He was afraid of death. Right. And uh, they, they talked about it all the time, and he was not afraid to talk to her about it. I know. And he was, so he revealed himself to her. Yes. He had to verbally and, and emotionally, psychologically, as he never had to anybody else. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, with me, sometimes he would call and said, oh, what are you doing now? And of course, I would say, oh, Mr. Goodman, nothing. He said, well, come on over. And, and then I would start looking where the clarinet is said, no, no, don't bring the clarinet. I just want to talk to you. He was lonely. She he was, was lonely. lonely. And he had he some lonely. very, very good friends, but um, there was there was a real loneliness 
there, which I'm I'm sure in part was related to knowing that obviously that he was soon to die. Yeah. Uh, and that he couldn't play music as he had. Um, so Julian, I want to talk a bit because this is so much part of my book. Um, let's see. My book, I guess, yeah. My book is called Dream Swing. Why is that? Um, I So my whole life I grew up, by the way, Eugene, how much time do we have here? No, that's okay. To... That, that's okay. You, you know what? I'm just stunned. Just listen to this conversation, and I'm absolutely fantastic historical conversation, I dare say. So please keep going. Please, please. Oh, I'm so glad. Good. So why did I call my book Dream Swing? When I was in my 60s, no, let me go back. Let me back up. My whole life, I felt inadequate because I couldn't swing, because I couldn't improvise, because I couldn't do what my daddy did. Now, I have a very profound, brilliant friend called Daniel Sapin, who said something to me very interesting. He said, you know, Rach, you weren't supposed to be able to do what your father did. He didn't want you to be able to do what he did. I said, you're kidding. She, he said, mm -mm, no, that was his territory. There were lots of reasons that you were afraid to improvise at the piano. And I look back now and I think that, that Daniel was right. My father, as I found many brilliant artists are, he was very protective of his territory and he felt threatenable somehow, which strikes me as amazing. So I had a couple of dreams, different, but a few years apart, in which I'm swinging on a swing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I thought that, and they both felt very, very delicious and wonderful. And I'm in a wooded area and it's beautiful. And you just, going back and forth. And only about a year after these two dreams, which were quite far apart, did I realize, Duh! swinging, I'm finally swinging <laughs> in the dream. So one of the things that my book is about, and a reason that I think it will be valuable to some readers, particularly valuable, is how do we, how do we escape this enormous shadow that is cast by a famous parent. I don't and, think you can. I don't think you can. Exactly. It, we can never escape it, but we can do something about it. So uh -huh. the analogy I use, and there are a zillion others I could, um, Liza Minnelli will always be Judy Garland's daughter, right? That's it. That's her fate. That's her fate. So... Um, I happened to have been born with two other talents besides music. Now, again, every talent requires discipline and hard work. The fact that you're talented at something kind of means nothing. It means you have, well, you have an edge, but there's still what has to go into developing it. So um, it was... And also I'm good with words, which as we said, <laughs> my father couldn't do it all. Just and aside here, I went crazy when I would try to either play chamber music with him or when I would just be working on a solo piano piece and I would ask him for his help because he didn't know how to say what he wanted. And that was of course partly why his musicians went crazy um, because he couldn't tell them how to play, because he didn't, how to play X, whatever. Um, and I'm sure Dick Hyman, whom you mentioned earlier, saw this. It's just do it until you get it right. Do it until you get it right. And then he'd hear it. Oh, okay, that's right. So, um, yeah, very, when I was playing with him, which I did quite a bit, and which was very thrilling in a certain way, although the whole time when I was playing with him, I never knew who I was. I was just Benny Goodman's daughter. It was it was very very hard, but I still I loved it in a way. So I I love to teach, and I don't even know. It's hard for me. I I, I when I was in my early twenties, somebody arranged a meeting for him with the Beatles who were then still very famous and they were playing at 
at Forest Hills. And um, my father was supposed to, to go to the concert and then do an on, on the radio commentary on it. And he asked me and Benji <laughs> to come to join him, which we did. And my father cared nothing about that kind of music, nothing. It was too foreign to him, as was all the hoopla. I mean, when my father played music, there was very little publicity. It was just him and the orchestra and his band or his guys, the quartet, whatever. There wasn't a lot of publicity possible. And it was, how can I put it? It was, I know, it was a more pure situation than one can encounter now in the last God, certainly 40 years. So, um, and so the Beatles arrived late, like a half an hour late. They come in by helicopter. All the fans are screaming, oh my God, <laughs> it was like the end of the world, the apocalypse or Armageddon or something. And um, they play, and then we go backstage with the Beatles. And it was unbelievably awkward. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know or like his music. And he didn't know or like theirs. <laughs> and Ringo Starr said um, to my father in the midst of this terrible silence, awkward silence, um, I had a, an LP of yours once, which of course was not the ultimate compliment. And mm -hmm. the whole thing was so uncomfortable that I wrote about it. And it was the first, I've kept a diary my entire, since uh, I was a teenager. It was the first non-diary thing I'd ever written. And I wrote about it. Just, I don't know, I had to. It was so strange the whole evening. And gathering up all my courage after I was done, I showed it to my father, who was God knows no kind of critic, but he said, okay, so his, his ultimate compliment was pretty good. That was the most he ever said. This is pretty good, Rach. Um, I know the um, editor, Arnie Gingrich at Esquire, why don't you send it in? And I did, oh my God, it was published. And so that began my incredibly ambivalent. So on the one hand, here I am being published for my writing. It wasn't, there was one word that was edited out. It was taken completely as, as it was. Um, so there I am, my own person, Rachel, but I'm writing about my father. And so there was always this, this can I be me without being his daughter? And the answer is, Sort of maybe sometimes, but not really. And after after I did that, there was a wonderful woman who lived near us in Connecticut called Josephine von Mitlosch. She was a Hungarian bar baroness who built her house with her own hands, very masculine woman. And she had a real sense of taking children, young people under her wing. She had, didn't have her own children. And she asked me if I would like to teach a creative writing class to some kids in the summer at the library. And I thought, I don't know. I mean, I've never taught. I have no idea what to do, but sure. So um, I said, yes. And these kids and I met at the library and as usual, and I'm realizing how much this is my style. I just kind of like played it by ear. I don't know what I'm going to do. I have no, I'm clueless, but I found a wonderful book in our family's library and I don't remember the title to my great pain, a black and white photography book of really strange photographs, like kind of almost surreal looking, but they were real life. So I opened, I went to see these, I met with these children who were all willingly there. None of them had been coerced by their parents. And I showed them a picture and all I remember it was a some huge bizarre statue with a ton of levers and pulleys and and people pulling it and i said to the kids write a story about what's going on in this picture how did what's what's happening how did that how did it happen how does it end just make up a story about it and they did they loved it and then we went around the room and everybody read their own story. And of course, every story was completely different. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. And I guess that's where I began my teaching. And I taught, I taught college for a lot of years. Um, let me see, how do, how do I approach this? 
Well, one of the things I can say, it took me a long time to become a good teacher, a long time. I was very strict. Like my father, he was my role model. My he Benny actually said about his band, first you got to make them hate you. <laughs> what a terrible thing to say. I mean, my feeling was first I had to make my students love me, not hate me. And um, I had very high standards and I was working with a lot of students who didn't have a good background. And I do, I was not getting good reviews at all. But slowly, I just kept at it. And I was determined. And that's one of his, one of Benny's mottos was, don't quit. That's what he said. He said to um, to um, Glenn, Glenn Miller. Is that, that's uh -huh. right, yeah. Benny, what do, what do I do next? I don't know. Where am I going with all this? And my father said, I don't know, Glenn. All I can say is don't quit. So that's been a motto that I've had. And it, it, serves, it serves anybody well. And I gradually became really, really good as a teacher <laughs> because I broke the rules. Mm. So there's this wonderful word that I'm hearing lately, transgressive. A transgressive person likes to break the rules. And uh -huh. how did I do that? I mean, I was a goody two-shoes as a child. I certainly behaved well. I was too intimidated by my parents not to behave well. But when I was on my own as a becoming a professor, a teacher, there I broke the rules. And in college, this always strikes me as really interesting. When you're an English teacher, I was a comparative literature major, undergrad. Oh, wait, I have to say one more thing here. I know I'm jumping, but I think this is very relevant. I went to Boston University. Wish I hadn't, wish I'd gone to a small private school. But um, I didn't do well in boarding school. The only thing I, I did really well in was Latin because I love language. And um, so there I was at Boston University and I'm taking a freshman comp class, which everybody has to take. And the teacher asked to see me about my writing. And we're sitting together. So what was I, 17? <laughs> And he said, you know, Rachel, I'm really interested in your writing. There's, And this was an essay writing. It was not quote unquote creative. He said, there's a certain quality here. And I, I don't know how to describe it. He said, I guess I'd call it jazzy. <laughs> I went, oh my God, wow. how is this possible? And well, of course, now I know how it's possible. So that, that sense of improvising somehow or off the beat, or I don't even know what to call it, made its way into my writing and when you teach college writing, as I did, what you're supposed to do, what the state has decreed that you have to do <laughs> for, to all the enslaved teachers is work from a, um, a textbook. <clears throat> this was, I, I don't know if it's how much it's changed because I haven't taught in college for um, six years. The textbook has a number of essays on different, on various hot political topics, pro and con, like one of them these days must be um, um, the use of pronouns, huh? Because pronouns are, are changing. Um, and some people are, are they, and for English teachers like me who are of this age, it's very confusing and kind of crazy making because they are supposed to be more than one person, but it's, and you know, people sign their pronouns, all of that. <clears throat> so that would be an example of the kind of thing that students are reading essays about, and then they have to write an argumentative essay taking a stance one side or another. And I thought, this is horrible. I can't stand it. They hated it. I hated it. Because it's all it's all very cut and dried and very forced and enforced. And an amazing moment for me was when I was in the faculty room <clears throat> at Sacramento City College where I taught for years. And one of the one of the teachers said to nobody in particular, to her colleagues, you know, when I go home over the weekend, and I have a bunch of student essays under my arm. I just want to put needles in my eyes. Mm. <laughs> and I told that to the students. And I said, this is after a few years of teaching when I finally figured out I'm going to do my own thing. I said, since teachers want to put needles in their eyes reading your boring essays that you're having to write, and since you no doubt wanted to put needles in your eyes when you were writing the essays, let's just change the game here. So <clears throat> I 
began making up my own course, my own courses. The first one was censorship. I did propaganda. I did corporations. I did evil. And we didn't have a textbook. And I would have the students, I put the students in a semicircle so that I could see everybody. Nobody was looking at anybody's heads. I could also see, I could be watching out for them taking out their phones. And um, the student would, would, so I began working with three materials, kinds of materials. We would um, look at YouTubes about, oh, also, let me back up. The last five years I was teaching, my topic was the selling of addiction in America, because addiction is sold in America. And that little simple example is binge watching. To binge used to be a negative word. Now it's not. Now it's something it's cool to do. Uh -huh. um, in fact, the other day, I, I was very tired this week <clears throat> for a bunch of reasons. And I, I did the first binge watching ever I ever had done. I looked at episode after episode of, a, of an old series called The Wire. I'd heard about it. I'd never watched it. I loved it. It was fun to binge watch. I had nothing else to do. So um, this, I would have the students either, on, let's say on this topic of addiction, they would either watch a YouTube, somebody talking about, let's say, addiction to social media, to their iPhone. I would do very complex and dark and ambiguous movies, YouTubes and YouTubes and podcasts. And podcasts. And those we had day one, I would say, we aren't going to use a textbook. And they'd go, what? No textbook? And my classes were really exciting. So the students would do the assignment. They had to write 200 and 500, 500 words per class, two classes a week. And I didn't want to know. Let me begin again. Some students who hadn't who had been, I would say, mostly coerced, they would write what the assignment was about because they didn't know how to think about the assignment. So they'd write about the plot of the movie or the plot of the YouTube. No, 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 no. What do you think about it? I wanted to know how did this affect you? And they were different students would see different things, they'd respond differently, and we'd go around the classroom and every student would make would say the major points that he or she had seen. And then very often I would drill in and I'd say, oh, that is so interesting. Tell me why you thought that way. And first they'd go, God, I don't know. And I could tell they were really irritated. They didn't want to be pushed. But then eventually they came to see how they arrived at their interpretations, and this was reinforced by the other students doing the same thing because they were all in the same boat. I called on everybody and the students who were freaked out and said, I can't speak up in class, I'm too shy. I say, don't worry about it. I call on everybody, you don't have to say more than a few words, everybody participates in my class. And so they all got with the program. And that was how, <laughs> That was how we all learned to swing in the classroom because everything was unpredictable. And I would be responding to their comments at the moment and they'd be responding to their comments at the moment. And we were all, um, we were all swinging together. And then I want to say there was one particular kind of essay um, that I heard about that's a very interesting kind of avant-garde style called the collage essay, where um, you take, in fact, I will say how that led to my book that I just finished writing. You take a topic and you do, you take a topic which is really central to you and often really painful to you, and you write about it. And you write in little brief paragraphs. They do not have to connect well. And you do inside research. You write about your experience with this topic. And then you do outside research. You write, you find stuff online. Um, so I'll just, I'll tell you the three essays that I kept from my students that I found the most 
the most useful as um as examples. One boy wrote about his pornography addiction, which I'd never heard of at that point. One boy wrote about his addiction to his iPhone, and one boy wrote about his addiction to TV. And I told my students, I would give them, I would hand out these, these essays for them all to read and we'd discuss them. And I'd say, okay, now I want you to do your own. And I want you to know that nothing you write is going to shock me or make me judge you. I'm not going to, I'm not going to grade these. I can't grade you writing from your heart. I can't do that, but it's your assignment. And I said, I have walked, because this is true, I've walked through my own dark hallways. I, I understand myself. I've looked at the sides of myself that frighten and that disgust me. And I know pretty well who I am. So if you write about that, it's not going to freak me out. And a lot of my students wrote that at the end of the essay, I would say, write how was this experience for you? Analyze how you felt writing this and what it is either done for you or perhaps not done for you or done against you. And a lot of my students wrote that it was the most valuable thing they'd ever done in their lives or at least in college. And that's the kind of teacher I am. And um, I'm now about to getting, I'm, um, I've been in, in living in Berkeley now, coming on my sixth year, and I'm about to get back into doing however I can, teaching or tutoring, because it's a very exciting thing to do. That's fantastic. Mm. Very touching. And, uh, okay, so we held you for long. <laughs> Rachel, thank you very much. Now, but I don't want to finish uh, 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 our conversation like that. Uh, would you be so kind to show us some pictures, please? Yes, I would love to show you some pictures. Yes. So here's, uh -huh. wait, let me begin with the youngest. Maybe here it is on the floor. Uh, uh, um, so here is, and you tell me if I'm holding it at the right distance. Just a little bit further, please. But, uh, a little bit back. Oh, a little bit back. Uh, Say when? Ah, uh, 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 oh, that's perfect. Is that good? Okay. Oh, how old are you here? I'm about four years old, and I don't four know years who old. or where, but I just love it. That's fantastic. Yeah. So, so beautiful picture. So yeah. beautiful picture. So here, the next one, I think I'm about 12. Again, I don't know where or who took it. I also love this one. Oh, yeah. A little bit to the back, please. Like this? A little bit more. Okay. Well, we, we, we can see your father, but we cannot see you. So that's the problem. <laughs> oh, so sad. Can, can, we, can we move it a bit closer, maybe? No. Okay. Right. We barely see your father, which, which is great. I'd like to see you, but oh, well, it's it's an internet connection problem. Oh, I'm okay. sorry. Okay. So no. let, me, let me try the third one. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a great moment. So... Um, and there's about to be a broadcast in July about this event. So I was contacted. Um, I had, oh yeah, I had played in Carnegie Hall with my father, something about which I felt completely undeserving because I, I, I don't know, everybody would say to me, Rachel, your father wouldn't have played concerts with you unless you'd been good enough. Obviously. That's right, for but sure. I never, ever, ever felt I was good enough. That was who I was. I hadn't been to Juilliard. I hadn't been to music school. I, I worked pretty hard. I just happened to have talent and to be his daughter. So I played at Carnegie Hall with him. And um, somebody from Carnegie Hall contacted me. Oh, I know it was Gino Francesconi, a wonderful man who's in charge of their archives, or who was. He's now retired. And he said, um, Rachel, there's a new museum called the Rose Museum, which has um, in it, it's, it's about Carnegie Hall. And we'd like you to come and give a speech about your father because of course of his terribly important concert there in 1938 and dedicate his clarinet, which as I thought of it was gonna then become the cornerstone of the museum. So mm. this is a picture of me, I think I was 50. Now tell me where to hold this. A, a bit a, a bit uh, up please. Aha, uh -huh, that's perfect. Oh. Okay. 
So there I am. I'm 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 wearing a wonderful sequin dress that I borrowed from my friend Katya because yeah. I had garments of this fanciness. And when um, was that? Uh, what, what year was that? I was fifty. So that was like thirty years ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. And um, hold on just a second. So um, to my right is my father's very close friend Bill Highland. Can you? Uh, is the picture good again? On, on, on top. Yes. It, and then to my left is Isaac Stern. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Just a little and, bit to the back, please. I yes, I can see Isaac. Yes, yes. right. Uh -huh. He is applauding. <laughs> That's right. And I gave a speech, and um, it was a it was a wonderful event. Really a wonderful event. Although I still hated my father when I did this. I did. And I remember as I walked out on stage to give the speech, you know what I said? Yeah. I said to myself, get thee behind me, Benny. I was still full of hate. Wow. And it, yeah. And um, it's really very liberating to be beyond that. But it's taken me this long. Yeah. Well, it took you writing this book. Yes, that's what it did. And it and was not my goal. And my by goal. the way, about this book, do you think when it'll be published? I don't know. I've I've sent it to a few agents. Mm -hmm. Hasn't yet found somebody. Um, I know there are a lot of factors here. One is it's really hard to get published these days. Um, another one is that my book is very strange in the sense that it's it's what's called a literary memoir. Um the way I write is as important as what I write. In other words, it's not just ordinary writing because I'm a very good writer and it's a very it's very creative. It's very um, psychological. Um, it's I it has very high level of vocabulary because I guess I'm an intellectual, and also it describes a number of really mysterious and in, inexplicable experiences I've had that when some people read it, they're going to think she's psychotic, but I'm not. Mm. I've just had a lot of strange experiences yeah. in, around my father. I read about them. I read the book, the manuscript, except the last chapter. It's fantastic and it'll find the publisher and it should be great. Yeah, I'm sure also, it will. I, I, I want to end on my part that mm -hmm. there's not a day that goes by that I don't listen to Benny's playing. Oh, beautiful. Oh, yeah. Every single day. And I can't tell you how many tears I shed. Mm -hmm. And it still brings tears to my eyes when I when I hear him play. And I, every time I think I'm such a lucky man, you know, I must have, God kissed me somewhere there. <laughs> and Leon, you know, after I started visiting your dad quite a bit, he said, Julian, you know that the fact that Benny took you is much more important than if you won a lottery, or, uh, you know, a million dollars. That's true. That's a really interesting point. And, and he was absolutely right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we live in this commercial world where money's supposed to count more than anything, and it's really relationship. Yes. Yeah. It counts more than anything, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. Well, okay, at right. least to me, and I'm sure it's the same for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was very lucky. Very, very lucky. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Rachel. It was a real, it was a real like honor to have you for this conversation. It's absolutely. I'm uh, unspeakable, and there's usually, uh, usually, Julian said this occasion. It's priceless. <laughs> I love yeah. this. So, Rachel, thank you so much. I'm honored, and I think it'll be very, very educational and interesting for. Uh, just for general people, not necessarily music lovers. And also, I have to add, you look stunning. You look great. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>